It is really great to be here in California, especially since, as I left my house yesterday in Illinois, it was about 25 degrees, and that's Fahrenheit, not Celsius. So I'm appreciating the opportunity to be here and certainly the weather. So I study people and robots, and the title of my talk today is Rise of the Civil Robots, uh, which is a bit of a play on the uh, original arcade game from the 1990s that some, some may remember, which was a fighting game. And uh, we're really interested in mainly the applications of, of robotics technology and specifically understanding human-robot inter interaction in the context of the field in which I work, which is civil and environmental engineering systems. So I think before getting into the specifics of the research, I think it's important to talk about uh, some of the robots that you all may be familiar with. And even if you don't work in robotics, surely you've seen many of these through Hollywood movie and entertainments, and they've been our, our friends, our enemies, uh, they've been very hard to believe in terms of their capabilities, and sometimes they've been very believable, depending on, on your take of that particular thing. Uh, but these aren't the robots of reality. These aren't the robots that people are doing research with. And so the people that they are, the robots that people are doing research with are those that you may see here. There tends to be a lot of work done with social robotics these days. So ro person in front of the robot uh, focused on healthcare, the elderly, things of this nature. So you have Pero the seal, you have the now robot, working specific people working on uh, advances with uh, children with autism, for example. Uh, you might notice the Roomba, the, the very commercially successful robot that I can say vacuums my house very well. The problem is, is that when we want to go into civil and environmental engineering domains, these really aren't the robots that we want to take with us to do things. So having said that, uh, where can we find these robots? Where can we uh, get them to use for our specific problems in civil and environmental engineering? And the truth is that uh, this really comes out of the search and rescue community. So the use of robots in search and rescue really started back in the 1980s, but it wasn't until the 2001 World Trade Center collapse that they really uh, were used in disaster situations. And the breakthrough was really the shift to small tactical robotics that could fit easily into voids where people and dogs couldn't go. Now since 2001, there have been land, sea, or area vehicles been being deployed in over 26 documented disasters in the United States, Japan, places such as China, Haiti, Italy, and New Zealand. And a majority of ground robot deployments have been for underground mine disasters, Marine vehicles have been used twice as, twice as frequently as ground vehicles, and ground vehicles have been used twice as frequently as the small aerial vehicles that you may be familiar with. So robots have primarily been used for searching survivors, or for better human-robot interaction, is needed to offset the loss of depth perception and perception to other typical view issues we come up with, such as unusual viewpoints, They've been used for reconnaissance and mapping. We have mobile manipulation of doors, which obviously remains a challenge. And they're used for inspection of buildings, where image stabilization, resolution, photogrammetrics are really essential. We also have marine vehicles that have been used for structural inspection of bridges, where surface vehicles can use wireless networks uh, to function in GPS shadows, where signals are lost. And then we have underwater vehicles that can cover a large area, but then they get into trouble when we have to do obstacle avoidance uh, needed in some of the debris fields that we encounter post-disasters. Now, I'll tell you, just to be perfectly honest, robots have never found a living survivor in a major disaster as they typically come on the scene about four and a half days after uh, the event has occurred, and so most victims who are trapped typically die within two days. Um, but this is going to change after robots get adopted more by the response community. Now, the previous place, as it was mentioned, where I worked was uh, the Center for Robot Assisted Search and Rescue, and 15 of 26 of those deployments came out of that group. Uh, the observations that were found in the work that was done there are that 15 of, or I'm sorry, the observations are that ground robots are almost always tethered, and this is for two main reasons. We have wireless network problems. Uh, they can be unreliable in the dense rubble, metal rebar in mines or inside commercial structures, such as nuclear power plants. You saw some images of Fukushima. And I think, secondly, the most of the voids and the entries are made from above, so robots trying to penetrate down below. We don't want to lose the robot, so having a tether is good to bring it back. The other big surprise that we have is that mobility has not really been the major factor. 
Uh, it's the dirt, the water, the mud that tend to muck up the sensors that we try to use in these types of applications. And uh, specifically, we get into trouble with aerial vehicles that need to operate within just a few meters of a particular structure. So being able to get those views for structural engineers while also taking into account ob object avoidance, turbulence, issues related to structures can be a, a, a big problem. I did want to mention that I'm also a member of Robot Assist Without Borders. This is a conglomeration of people that's centered around the Center for Robot Assisted Search and Rescue. And we go into disaster type of situations to leverage the assets that we have to help people on the ground, such as civil and environmental engineers and responders, make better decisions. And this is where we're getting the robots to focus on for civil and environmental engineering applications. So there's three points that I, I really want to cover today in my talk as it relates to humans and robots working together. The first point is that unmanned systems really allow us to get very quick access to these difficult domains that I'm showing you. And it doesn't have to be a post-disaster domain. It may well be a, a riparian buffer zone where we're interested in doing river mapping or something like that. Unmanned systems are very important for civilian operators who may now have more easy access to the technology. We do run into problems with aerial vehicles because the FAA obviously has certain guidelines that we have to follow, but it gets less restricted when we consider surface vehicles or ground vehicles. The second point that I'd like to make is that all unmanned aerial systems will involve a human robot team. In the literature, what I found is we tend to see three typical roles. Flight director, mission specialist, and commander, or I should say pilot, mission specialist, and commander, uh, that when people are using robots in these types of situations I'm describing, those roles become necessary. But the focus typically with the interaction with the robots has mostly been on the pilot, and we'll see that in some of the interface technology. Thirdly, I think the results of the work that I've done in the past show that the human pilot is actually necessary for assistance and understanding within the human robot team. This is especially important for ad hoc teams where you might not have trained roboticists. It may be the hazmat technician, the, the geologist, the hydrologist who shows up to work with the team. They're not trained, but they need to be able to use the system very quickly and easily to capture the data that they need. And I think making this statement, I think there are implications for increased levels of autonomy or fully autonomous systems, uh, as we'll see in some of the results. So I'd like to talk first about small unmanned aerial vehicles, and this is what I, I think I have the most experience with in, in my work as a PhD student and in, in coming to Illinois. When we talk about small unmanned aerial vehicles, the examples you see here are pretty typical. We have dragon flyers and air robots that we use in my work, but we have smaller, more commercially available, and I should say cheaper, platforms like Parrot. Uh, they have uh, models that are specifically targeted more towards law enforcement. That's maybe going to be your aero environment or your dragon flyer. Then we have more robots that we typically found in a military application like, like Honeywell. So some of the brief characteristics, they tend to be small, about three meters in diameter. Distance, there's the, the distance we can go and there's the distance that the FAA will let us go. So many of these platforms could easily do two miles, but FAA does restrict us for flying actually line of sight and staying within a couple of hundred, me couple, couple of hundred feet in our flights. Uh, the biggest limitation, I would say, is probably payload capacity. We have some really wonderful sensors, and they probably weigh more than one pound, depending on the application. So that's a big limiting factor, which ties into the other limiting factor, which is an in endurance. Even some of the most sophisticated platforms, we're still really only seeing about 20 minutes in battery life. So power is sort of a major research issue. We don't really address that, obviously, in my group, but for the electrical engineering crowd, having longer battery life is really important, especially for the quad rotors. So some of the applications, obviously, see we saw first in urban search and rescue, but as the uh, military conflicts around the world have wound down, when small tactical aerial vehicles were, were developed and deployed, there was a lot of military operations, and those companies are looking to rotate that technology back into the civilian sector. A couple of areas where we've seen it most pronounced is in law enforcement and fire and rescue. If you're a firefighter and you can get up above and see very quickly on the top of a building uh, certain parts that may be on fire, that allows you to assist your team for an approach into actually putting out that fire. Obviously, military operations and in the domain in which that I 
uh, did my PhD studies was Seaburn, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear, things like chemical train derailments, Fukushima, and we think that UA, small UAVs can be a strong asset for responders in that particular area. So let me talk about a bit about Seaburn. Seaburn, Seaburn activities are typically those types of incidents that get worse over time and not better. And so what we, what we have with the individuals working in those environments are specially trained responders. They know their stuff and they know things when they see them. So being able to visualize, let's say in the case of a, a chemical train derailment, that information on the side of a car where they don't have to get geared up into a hazmat suit that may take time, it allows them to, to get in very quickly and get information to help make a decision either themselves or to form incident commanders to make uh, uh, decisions that are good for the scene as a whole. And I think uh, I, I really can't drive home the point enough of the presence of ad hoc teams, though they may be very specialized and trained, a lot of these teams will just show up and start to work together and integrate together. And being able to do that within the context of a human robot team is very important. So the interfaces that they use need to be very easy to use. So let me talk about those three roles just briefly that we see in the literature and in our own activities. There are three, flight director, pilot, and mission specialist. So the flight director is essentially responsible for the overall safety of the team. They're responsible for the situation awareness and the management of the team. We tend to like to refer to this person as the guy who doesn't let the other two guys fall in a ditch. And uh, it, it's a very important role. They, they do have final say over where, whether a mission might end. That's important, but not in all situations. So we have the flight director. We have obviously the pilot who's responsible for the UAV, its airworthiness and maintenance. They'll be flying line of sight, as I mentioned previous, by regulation, but they might also be the navigator too. Then we move to the mission specialist role. In this mission specialist role in an ad hoc human robot team, it's gonna be your hazmat technician, your geologist maybe hydrologist. They're not a roboticist, but they know what they're looking for. If they're a structural engineer. Um, that's very difficult to translate into a computer vision system what may be wrong on the side of a building, but a structural engineer can know it and see it. And that's the type of person who may fill this role. So they collect reconnaissance data and they direct the pilot for camera control. So if we look at the, interna the interaction technology findings for existing human robot teams up to the point of the work that I've done here, they tend to, they tend to follow that pilot-centric, high-performance team interface where you have joysticks and push buttons. You might have video if you're lucky. You probably will, although a large percentage of the screen may be occluded by pilot-centered information. They often have simple menus and display, and again, I talked about those artifacts on those video feeds. So on the really fancy ones, this is typically what they see, what we see. And that's not to knock these vendors. They're very good platforms. It just may not be the best thing for the mission specialist operating as part of the human robot team. So when we look in the literature uh, for specifically that mission specialist role, we see three findings. We see oftentimes that the human roles overlap both spatially and in coordinated functions. Uh, they, this, this may be, be uh, preventing certain types of uh, uh, limitations for individual roles. Is the mission specialist operating at the level that they need to be to do their job if they have to, for example, work through the pilot? And this picture was the, really the photo that started all of this work that I took a couple of years ago when we were doing some, some, uh, some proto studies for a class. And up until my work, this is what you would typically see when you had a response group go out. You would have a pilot in the middle who was taking care of the robot. And uh, the, ha the uh, specialized responders would effectively creep over their shoulder and look at what they're doing. And we felt like uh, not having a, a role-specific interface was problematic. We, at best, we see shared, duplicate, or passive interaction. So the mission specialist just watching and, and talking in the ear of the pilot the whole time. But if you have somebody whose job it is to interpret and analyze the imagery, then you really get into the problem of violating good human-computer interaction principles. If one of you and I have to work on a Word document together, we probably shouldn't be using the same computer. Uh, 
So to effectively collaborate, we need our own types of interfaces that, that, that best optimizes what tasks we're trying to do. And so we think that the mission specialist in this situation would be performing suboptimally, and I'll get into the specifics of, of how we would measure that a little bit later in the experiments. Uh, and then thirdly, we see a lack of software-based interfaces. They tend to be more hardware-based, which presents limitations on customizing, rep prototyping. And so uh, having that puts effectively a dis uh, an interaction limitation on what the team could be capable of if we wanted to go into maybe a, a new and different domain. So this really gets us to what the research question is, is, is what is the appropriate human robot interface for this mission specialist uh, in a small unmanned aerial system that increases individual role performance? If it's this good now with this, how much better can we do by changing the nature of the way the team members interact? And so I'll really just give you the answer to the question right up front, and then we'll get into the experimental data. So, uh, what we see is that a mission specialist in a small unmanned aerial system requires a user interface that firstly contains role-specific information, so understanding camera tilt, zoom, pan, the payload information very clearly. It needs to share what we call filtered visual common ground, uh, video feed, if you will, with the pilot. Common ground is uh, those knowledge, beliefs, and suppositions that you may share with a person. And we do this visually for... Um, for this type of situation, we use the video feed. It also needs to permit shared control of the camera with a pilot. And there also needs to be the ability to have verbal communication, verbal interaction with the pilot in the mission, between the pilot and the mission specialist. And we've learned these things by studying uh, 26 specialized personnel in the Seaburn community, setting up a series of experiments. And what they've done is, is in, through this process, uh, provided feedback through survey instruments that they experience greater confidence, more comfort, better perceived individual and team performance using this type of specialized interface. And I think most importantly, they were able to complete tasks up to two times faster, which is important because of the limited battery life that we see with small UAVs. And I think the research is important because it suggests that a human pilot role is necessary in the human robot team for assistance and understanding when we especially we get to that verbal communication. And there are hidden dependencies that we find in the human robot team that can affect performance, and we'll see this when we, when we talk about the shared roles model. So having said all of that, how do we even start to study people in a human robot team? Well, we use the shared roles model. And the shared roles model really was developed for generic unmanned systems, but we applied it here to aerial vehicles. Shared roles model is a hybrid between what we call the remote, tool, the remote tool model and the taskable agent model. You can think of the remote tool as robot kind of as hammer. It's a tool. It just does basic things. The taskable agent model, on the other hand, is robot, go get me a soda, and it just works. But in uncertain environments, that's, always not very, that's not always very practical. So shared roles really sits in the middle, assuming a certain level of semi-autonomy. Now, this is a reasonably complex model if you, have, if you consider all of the shareholders uh, within the context of the system. But for the purposes of the experiments that I did, what we did was essentially neglect the stakeholders, a policy decision maker that may be providing directives to the human robot team. We also took out the safety officer in terms of communication. We focused mainly on the pilot and mission specialist, and this allowed us to simplify the types of hypotheses that we were asking. So having said that, the shared roles model represents humans and robots as co-agent. It's robot as partner. It's robot that allows my reach and vision to be extended so they work together. Uh, we have four <laughs> shared roles present in this model. We have a pilot platform telefactor and we've got a mission specialist payload telefactor. So the pilot's obviously the person responsible for control and manipulation. Which is, coupled, which is coupled with the robotic telefactor. And as far as their view of the robot, they have an exocentric view. They're looking at it from the outside. They've got eyes on it all the time. Then we've got the mission specialist. That, that role is coupled with the payload telefactor. They're operating and controlling, zooming, tilting the camera to interpret imagery. And they usually have an ecocentric view. So they've got the robot's eye view. And then finally, there, there's the verbal channel between the two roles.
Now, I should mention that the shared roles model itself is based on David Woods' joint cognitive system, which really addresses the what and the why rather than a, than a how. And what I mean by that is that the shared roles model really isn't a y equal x squared, here's a number, and we get some answer. It's not predictive, it's, it's empirical. So it's driven by experimental data and understanding hypotheses, okay? And it allows us to look at uh, delegation bottlenecks, dependency bottlenecks, coordination barriers that can occur in the human robot team, both within the individual team members and the, the uh, telefactors, whether it be play, payload or platform, as we'll see. Okay. So how do we set this up for the state of the practice? Well, the state of the practice is what we call passive coordinated unfiltered. And that's what you would see in the upper left hand corner there. As those, those mission specialists are looking over the shoulder, they see what the pilot sees. The screen is very crowded with information that has nothing to do with the mission specialist. So they all share the same interface. The mission specialist is viewing, the pilot is viewing and controlling. So we have 100% on the verbal channel, okay? That's the state of the practice, passive, coordinated, unfiltered. So we said, okay, well, what happens if we just give a, a, uh, a mirrored interface with some basic manipulation of the camera to the mission specialist to allow them to uh, control the camera, take pictures? Well, we decided to develop a system on an iPad that allowed them to, take, to, uh, to leverage the affordances like swipe, swipe and uh, pinch for controlling the camera up and down, zooming, and then they have an image uh, capture button that they're able to utilize. And so in comparison with the passive coordinated approach, we have what we call the active coordinated approach, which is mission specialist is in direct control and they, they uh, try to do everything themselves. So they can not only view, but they can also control because there is now a separate interface. Yes? Is that one and the same camera that the pilot may need in order to actually direct the, the flight? In, in this, that's a great question, because in this particular situation, we used a single camera. In other situations, we could use multiple cameras, but at, at least up until the point of this work, we only see single cameras on UAVs. But if we change to a second camera, it potentially gets different, but as we'll see when we focus that visual common ground, it could become problematic for the mission specialist, but the pilot really is the critical player because if they can't see where they're going, that's a bad thing. So, so one camera, and that's, that's a great question. So uh, we've changed from passive coordinated unfiltered to active coordinated filtered. We've removed that iconography off, this, off the, uh, the visual display for the, um, for the mission specialist. And here's what we saw in our exploratory study. We saw mission specialists, these trained responders, capturing two times as many images with the passive coordinated system, so asking the pilot to do everything. Okay. Now the reasoning behind that was if it doesn't really cost you anything to ask for it, then you're probably going to ask for it. So I think that's where the two times the images come into play. They also reported greater role empowerment, confidence, comfort individual and team performance when being able to just ask the pilot. Now some of this may have come back to uh, the interfaces aren't exactly the same, they're pretty close, but there could have been a perceived latency control uh, being a factor in that if the pilot, if they're, a, if they're a novice interacting with the iPad, they may have perceived the pilot to be much more sophisticated with their controls. It wasn't exactly a matter of latency in terms of Okay, I swipe and then it takes like five seconds. Not, not really that, but just perhaps a, a latency on their part. The third thing that we found, uh, which in some ways was not surprising, was really a lack of adequate visual feedback for the mission specialist. We just took away the iconography, like battery life, distance to home, and things like that. But we found that the video was just simply not enough for the mission specialist to make a decision and have a certain level of situation awareness as to where they were pointed. They're in direct control. What, let's say, for example, you're flying, and even on a reasonably calm day, you get the robot to pitch a little. If you're in the process of swiping to tilt the camera down, your robot pitches, then you think you've overcorrected and you can get lost. And we were seeing that. Okay. 
So the visual common ground needing to be more focused or to provide additional feedback to the mission specialist to let them know exactly what they're doing, something beyond just the video, was another recommendation that came out from this proto-exploratory study that we did with Mission Specialist 1.0. Yes. The swiping. Okay. So the swiping changes the, actually the pitch of the camera or just the, um, the window out of the, the general view of the camera that you see on that, um, the specialist display? Okay, so the, so the camera itself can go from zero to 90 degrees. So the swipe would go from, it would take you to any point in between here and here. And the same goes for zooming in and zooming out. We did also have a, uh, a left turn so you could swipe to the side. Uh, it wasn't actually used very much because once you centered up on a position that you wanted to get to, you were okay. But l sometimes it was like, okay, I'm trying to get this additional piece down here. Let me swipe down. Yeah. The, the specialists now change the pitch of the camera. Yes. And the pilot may get confused and don't know what the orientation is of the craft. Yes, and that's where we get into potential conflicts that we'll see in the, the shared roles model. That's, but that is a key issue. Yes. Um, were these real missions or did you kind of like set up scenarios? No, these were actually flown at uh, Disaster City, which is a 52 acre campus. Imagine building a city. Oh, this is at Texas A&M building a city and destroying it. So the train that you saw in the video was where we flew. We flew on fixed waypoints, both for the exploratory study, and as I have a slide for the, exp the actual experimental study that we did. Uh, we had three waypoints, two separate flights. We would task to those waypoints, and uh, so we could create conditions that were the same for all participants, and then we might ask them questions like, find this object, and that's when they had to go through and do it. So, uh, but yes, it was, a, it was an actual true full-size train wreck that we flew them out there. Okay, so we know we need to focus the visual common ground. And this led us into the development of Mission Specialist Interface 2.0. So if we have our passive coordinated interface where they effectively just get to watch, we know we have shared common ground, we have the artifacts filtered out, uh, and then we, uh, we only let them verbally direct the pilot. So it's, it's basically just a mirror display. This is our, our passive coordinated condition. We then went to what we were calling the dual coordinated interface. The dual coordinated interface shares the same visual common ground with the pilot. We have the filtering additionally. Oh, I think I have some, uh, some markers with that. Yeah, so we share our visual common ground. We, the, we uh, filter the, the artifacts out. We have some mission specialist uh, specialization. We added an overhead map to the particular area that also includes the uh, an indicator as to the location of the robot, just like your Google Maps if you're in your car, but also an arrow indicating the direction where they were facing because there were many times where people just simply got lost. Which way am I pointing? That's, that became an issue. Uh, we also permitted them to, um, oh, and then the additional uh, specialization was the camera in the tilt so that they would know exactly what they did as far as tilting the camera and zooming the camera. We also added a compass. This was one of the interesting things that came in the feedback, that it turns out that responders oftentimes give directions based on compasses. So we decided to include a digital, a digital compass, and many of the feedback or many of the verbal communications that occurred were, okay, give me 15 degrees off north, pilot, if they were communicating that way. So this was actually one of the very important things to include for this domain, for these types of participants. All right, uh, they can capture images themselves just as if before with the active interface. And uh, they can verbally direct the pilot. They can actively co um, control the payload. So how does this change? Well, with the active coordinated, we had view and control by the mission specialist with some communication and uh, the pilot view and control, obviously. But when we changed to the dual coordinated, um, we focus that visual common ground, that payload telefactor, by giving them that additional level of information. And as a result, what we have is an expectation that the verbal channel will decrease. If the mission specialists are able to do more themselves and understand more, then they're not gonna have to ask the pilot. Because, you know, I'll get to a little foreshadowing here. We haven't really talked about the impact on the pilot at all of this, which still kind of remains an open question. But this work focused on the mission specialists. So we have higher focused visual common ground, the mission specialists can control or take pictures themselves, or they can ask for it. So we have less verbal communication. 
than with the passive, but we don't know exactly how they perform. So we said we're in a set of experiments with 26 of these very specialized emergency responders that when there's a disaster, this is who we send. And it was primarily people from Texas Task Force One. And so we had them go through a series of three waypoints on two separate flights. And they answered questions related to each interface condition, things like uh, read the number on the tanker car, or capture images of any punctures or ruptures you may have seen in an overturned tanker car, or find this particular object. And the measurements that we took were uh, the task associated with the time, heart rate, and then we had a summative post-survey instrument that we, that, we got, that we gave them that looked at that confidence, comfort, best perceived individual role, and team performance. So what we see in terms of role empowerment findings, the dual coordinated role specific, our mission specialist 2.0, it was reported by responders that it gave them the most confident, confidence in, in terms of, of locating objects and capturing images, the most comfort it was easier for them to do. They had the best perceived individual performance with it and the best perceived team performance with it. Now I talked about those tasks just to give you a little bit more information. So for example, with a particular waypoint, we might find and identify a specific object. Once we had done that, we asked them for a certain level or a certain type of evaluation, whether it be reading numbers, counting things, uh, those same types of tasks that they would have to do in the field. And then also capturing images, for example, of disconnected wheel carriages or for a leak. So for task completion, what we see with the dual coordinated, uh, we had 2.1 times faster for uh, identification, 1.3 times faster for evaluation, and 1.6 times faster for capturing images. When we looked at the uh, levels of stress as measured by heart rate and heart rate variability, we didn't actually find that there was any difference between the two interfaces. There's a couple of things that can probably be said about that. One, I think first and most importantly, is at least it's not worse than what they were doing before. So, it doesn't, so this type of interface doesn't stress them out at any higher level, let's say, than doing it the way that they would, they would have normally done it. Um, and so it does beg the question are, as to our specialized emergency responders who go out and rescue us when we get into bad situations, are they really going to be stressed out by, a situ by capturing images with a robot? I think more work needs to be done in this particular area. If we were working with geologists and hydrologists who are not trained in the same way, although they're very tough people, uh, it, it might not uh, be quite the same, but at least in the measurements that we got through this experimentation, there did not seem to be a statistically significant difference. So in terms of the results of this uh, investigation, greater role empowerment, faster task completion time, no greater level of stress by allowing people to both ask the pilot and do it themselves, have greater focused visual common ground. Here are some other things that I think were pretty interesting, some formative observations that were made during this process. Well, it turns out command experience will tend to affect control preference. People with command level experience perceived dual coordination as the best, and that was measured by were you a team leader, were you a high level person, uh, did you have a lot of leadership experience, command and control experience versus it, were you a technician, uh, were you typically the member of the team? Were you a newer person? So non-command level people perceive the passive coordination as the best. They wanted to ask for it. Perhaps they were perceiving the pilot as the expert, as the leader, and that was something that they were more comfortable doing rather than having the team commander who kind of just wanted to do things themselves. Okay. So then we see a responsibility effect. So someone who would be responsible for the robot perceived passive coordination as the best. So if this would be a technician whose job it was to make sure the robot was in tip-top shape on that particular response team, uh, they'd rather have somebody else do it. But if you didn't have to be responsible for the robot, then you would just want to do everything yourself. So the, that was the responsibility effect. And here's where it gets kind of interesting, where we see verbal communication reducing and degrading over time. So we had a verbal protocol laid out in which the, the participants directed the pilot with very specific instructions. Turn the camera left, turn the camera right, tilt up, tilt down, take a picture. And every single one of the participants, even though the card was right in front of them and they were continuously instructed, would always, 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 and typically it was about five minutes in, deviate from that script that was there for them that they were being asked to follow. And you get things like, 
zoom camera left and pan camera in and get that and a smidge over here and a hair down. And so when you consider that type of interaction for let's say natural language processing, I promise you it will break. It, it, and so that said, the pilot who is a human would be able to, was able to understand and get the gist of what that person was saying and they were able to interact with the system in that way. So I think if the verbal channel is taken into account when we have more um, automated systems, let's say, having natural language processing that would be able to accommodate that type of variability is a very important factor that needs to be considered. So that's why a pilot was important. And this was something that was seen in every single participant all around the same time. Maybe the vocabulary was not chosen that great to begin with. Well, the... the, it, the why, why is camera always in there? That seems like redundant. Now, if you just say left, Right. You don't have to worry whether it's pan or zoom, and if you know, it's the right. probability of So, by like pruning it down to what you found in the deterioration, you may come up with a better vocabulary that then sticks more naturally. I agree, but then we can potentially get into some vague situations where if you instruct a system to turn left versus turn camera left, if the two objects, the robot or the camera, function independently, or if you have another person operating with it, would the system be able to understand? What, what object it should be operating on. So potentially, but uh, there, there is always room for variability on that. So when we look at the, when we talk, yes, question. Uh, was there any kind of enforcement mechanism about using their verbal protocol? Like, was there a consequence? Because I imagine if you have a system that just doesn't work, if you don't use the right words, people yeah. learn very quickly to use the right words. You, are you talking about, Okay, well, in the experiments, yes, we instructed them, and then when they did not use the right words, and we instructed them to use the right words, so there, them. yes, there, there wasn't a, an actual negative consequence like we stop things and no, you can't, you can't do this anymore. For a, um, I mean, if you had a natural language processing system, maybe it would just say, I don't understand what you said. That could perhaps be sort of a negative reinforcement. I do work with sketch recognition, and when somebody draws something that the system doesn't recognize, like, ah, try again. So perhaps something like that, but then you're still restricting people to say certain things and in very defined ways that if they're in a, in a situation where they need to act in a more natural manner like they would with a human, then being, you know, that's just more overhead that you're going to have to put, put on them as the human responder. It should just work in a perfect world. In a perfect world, right. So the shared roles model. Well, up until this time, we really thought about it in a, in a bit of a one-dimensional sense. It was just a model. But what we see in doing these experiments is that it's actually a space. So you have multi-dimensional uh, space that we consider. If we consider mission specialist control on the y-axis and focused visual common ground on the, on the x-axis, we can start to fill in and see these different spaces of interaction at which might occur depending on how we change the control and how we focus the visual common ground. Now in our first set of experiments, we considered active coordinated filtered and passive coordinated filtered. And we started there because we figured, well, gosh, if we just take all the iconography for the pilot off, that's probably a good place to start. We didn't feel like we needed to start all the way over here to the left on focused visual common ground. And what we saw was the passive was preferred. They captured more, infinite, more images, more comfort, more confidence, uh, and similar stress. So what it permitted us to do was basically establish an upper control coordination bound. Top place for responders, not the place they want to go. They want to be down here. That set us up to go with Mission Specialist 2.0. So because of the focused visual common ground observations, we moved a little bit further out there on the X. And when we compared those two, what we saw is that we have faster task completion and greater self-efficacy. But what about the commander and the responsibility effect? That kind of throws a weird situation in there because people who weren't commanders and weren't responsible for it, they want to be down here. They don't want to be up here. So the way that we basically decided on the dual coordinated uh, focused visual common ground interface was to say that even if you had that, you could still ask the pilot to do everything. But if you were a commander, if you weren't going to be responsible for the robot, then you could just do it all yourself. 
So that's what helped us arrive at what was the appropriate interface for this type of system with these users. So in terms of ongoing related work on this particular project, I think there are some immediate goals. We still need to analyze a lot of the video data for team process and performance. Uh, I wanted to graduate, so that this kind of became someone else's uh, job. But there are certainly lots of, of good information in there, I think, that can be put forward when we get into some of these open questions. Uh, and remember, I didn't say anything about the stress on the pilot. The pilot is really the next person that we need to look at in this type of interaction. And we need to do evaluations for rule collisions. I think in the long term, over the next three to six years, there really need to be more complex mission scenarios. I think it was a reasonable scenario that we set up, but it's not quite the same thing as an actual incident. So when somebody has to live in a tent for six days and still do all of this while interacting in the team, I think, I think more complete mission scenarios are very important for understanding of how people would use robots. <laughs> I think we also need to look at individual and joint situation awareness. You could probably argue that if you're asking task-based or identification questions, maybe you're getting into a level one, level two situation awareness where you're identifying things and you're understanding the connectivity of things, but you're not really getting up into a level three where you're saying, okay, I'm projecting into the future these things are going to happen. And situation awareness is hard because usually what people do to measure that is they stop you and ask you a series of questions to see what it is that you actually know and are aware of. But on a short flight like 20 minutes, we have problems doing that. So you can go with ways of developing implicit situation awareness metrics so, such that you base that off on performance, number of images taken. But all that has to be validated if you want to use performance metri metrics to predict situation awareness. And that, that takes a long time to actually do and validate. So I think some of the open questions as it relates to this or, or the, the one that's kind of been bur burning in my mind is what are the factors that caused someone to cede control to the pilot even if they were an expert and generally had a preference to, act to, to control the camera themselves? What was it, was it wind? Was it just, uh, did, did they lose where they were? When they asked the pilot to do something, why were they ceding that control over to the pilot when fundamentally they reported they wanted to have it? Uh, and then what impact does this have on the pilot throughout the scope of the mission? What other visual forms of communication are important? And by that I mean diagrammatic communication. If you've seen John Madden football, he does a lot of sketching on teleprompters. This guy's going here, this guy's going here. Can we incorporate and try to bring down the verbal channel by simply having someone make a quick sketch? Go here. And the pilot sees what that person's sketch or what that person's indicated. Whether it takes the form of a sketch or a pen, it's perhaps a quicker way now that we've sort of disconnected that pilot from that mission specialist. And then finally, I think it, it, the question should be asked, is the pilot more tightly coupled to their telefactor than to the mission specialist with regard to situation awareness, orientation? Because if you're the pilot, you're very well trained on the system. So if you need to make a minor correction, you're, the odds are you're probably not going to get lost as easily as somebody who just walked up five minutes ago. So understanding those, those individual uh, roles is important. So in, in my last 10 minutes or so, I'd like to take you into a couple of examples. I, I, I promised some interesting and new and different applications that we're trying to do. Uh, and and th up to this point, that's, that was mainly my PhD work, but it's translating us into doing some new and different things, uh, which is my Rainforest Robots project, which is basically asking the question, how effectively can we take a small UAS uh, to deploy wireless sensors uh, and retrieve them in, for environmental measurements in different types of forested canopies, let's say the tropical rainforests in Costa Rica. So there's some obvious problems with doing that. There are some barriers to rainforest canopies. These trees are very tall, 40 to 60 meters. The terrain can be very difficult to navigate, so you'd need a really tall ladder and have to take it through a really dense forest. And uh, the wildlife might, might not very, be very hospitable to that. I, hospitable to that. I can send my graduate students, but if they get eaten by a snake or a puma, I do not want to talk to my department at about that last uh, expedition that I had to do. So we think small and mandarial systems are a win for this. And on the human-robot interaction side, there's some motivation where we get into physical object-based uh, interaction. Um, when we want to not just see, but also place something, uh, 
what is the effect of that payload operation on the system? What are the impacts of having a moving target? This device is really just sort of dynamically floating out here, reasonably stable, but when we start moving and manipulating, how do those dynamics change? And then, of course, we have an uncertain environment, so uh, we need to get into better forms of visualization. We talked about what we think is good for reconnaissance and image capture and identifying locating objects, but what happens when we take it into a tree canopy? Uh, what type of view, whether it's a global or robot's eye view, hybrid, size and placement of elements in the, in the interface, and what effective arrangements are necessary. And then I think finally, what kind of feedback mechanisms, because if I'm flying and visualizing, I'm not, in theory, gonna be next to anything. But if I'm next to a tree, uh, and I'm actually touching something, what kind of tactile feedback, what kind of vehicle orientation, orientation needs to go, what type of payload operation, and how do we mitigate role conflicts if all of a sudden the pilot needs to, to get hold of that camera, and that's maybe where a second camera comes in being able to visualize with two roles. The motivation is obviously hydrology, where we have humid tropic regions and large areas. I have some of those statistics there for you. And why that uh, there, there aren't a lot of sensing applications out there to help us understand impacts on the regional climate, mainly just the economics, the, the density of the areas. Uh, but we know that some of these large transpiration rates in these um, ecosystems that are not water limited might be impacting the regional climate, but we need to study it. So the area we're looking at is the Soltis Center in Costa Rica where we have pretty extensive network of soil moisture sensors, other type of sensors, but we don't really have sensors in the canopy. And we think that we can put them there using small flying robots. We have a couple of different ways when we look in the literature of possibly doing that. We can do dorsal interaction. That might be good for something like a bridge, maybe not so much for a tree. If we like to drop things like uh, a penetrometer, if we're looking at soil liquefaction, that's good there. But mostly it's probably going to be a frontal approach to object placement. And I wrote a paper uh, a couple months back that laid out five challenges specifically for doing this. And we're trying to solve all of these now. Challenge one is what perspective view should the mission specialist have in this type of situation? Is it going to be egocentric or exocentric? It's probably going to be mixed. And how can these three points of, these points of view be represented properly in an interface for an ad hoc team? What type of visual common ground and how focused should it be? So where we have situations for visualization, a map, first person perspective, pretty good. But what happens when we need to start visualizing the instrument that we're just trying to place on the tree branch, for example? And uh, how do we need to visualize the, the robot in the canopy, both from above and aside? I think Nissan has a commercial where they do some image uh, de-warping where you can see all around you right now. So being able to have that type of visualization, probably both for the pilot and the mission specialist, is very important. What type of tactile feedback is going to be important for the mission specialist now that if you're actually touching something, how do you know if it's down? Okay. And that's probably going to be an automated process, but letting them know that things are okay is going to be uh, pretty critical. What type of latency? If we look at some of the prior work on, on teleoperation, Sheridan, for example, they were uh, giving examples of, let's say, one-second delays. But if you're actually trying to, to, to place something, is that going to be too much that you just can't do it? Okay. And then finally, what type of knowledge, skills, and abilities? I can tell you that as we trained responders to use the interface, probably about two minutes at the most, and they got, the, they got how everything worked. But if we're doing physical object manipulation, it's going to take some more time, we think. But we don't know exactly what that is. So in terms of year-by-year -year specifics as we're approaching this pro problem, in this first year, it's really kind of just started. So we're looking at platform development. Then we're getting into human-robot displays. Then we want to deploy it in the field. We developed some very low cost sensors. Not sure why that's not showing up. But basically off commercial, off the shelf, little hockey puck size sensors that give us temperature, humidity, uh, all of this uh, critical information for, for measuring in the tree canopies. Costs ballpark, 50 to $100. There are obviously some trade-offs in terms of accuracy. But uh, for our prototyping and our, just our ability to get something out there, we think that uh, this has been the way to go so far. So I can show you some examples of where we were doing proxim proximity flying uh, up into some tree canopies. We have a really wonderful research facility in Illinois, although it is very cold now, uh, called Allerton Park, which is where the, uh, the Sangamon River comes through. 
And this was just an example to see how closely we could get the robot into the canopy before it started freaking out. Um, and we actually didn't crash, which is always a good thing. So we can get pretty close. And the real question then becomes, if we can get close enough, how close can we get to where we just simply put that sensor out there? And these trees are obviously f different than the ones we would see in Costa Rica. We might have more accessibility to branches and, and, and stuff like that. But, but knowing where to put the sensor is going to be the job of, of the hydrologist or the, the ecologist to, to get what they need to get. So one other little set of information I'd like to give you. Uh, I, I'm, pretty, I'm very pleased to announce that uh, just recently we were awarded at Illinois a uh, NSF Critical Zone Observatory. And my quick sales pitch is if anybody has any interest in studying any, any fundamental processes related to geology, hydrology, ecology, anything like that in the, the, uh, the Midwest, talk to me because we are looking for collaborators now. And just as a, a, a basic overview, I'm obviously not in charge of this as a new person, but I will give you a couple of instances of what they're, they're looking at. They're looking at changing, changes from glacial legacy to future climates, what timescales are involved in that. They're looking at changes in biota and soil interactions and what kind of co-evolutions of biota uh, and soil effects uh, are going on. And then finally, uh, changes in transport and transformation. Um, connectivity, things of this nature. And if anybody's actually interested in seeing the project description that gets into more of the scientific questions, there are, we, I think there's about 40 investigators between Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, uh, Purdue, who are investigating this. But the reason why we have the CZO, and I think it raises interesting questions, is it gives challenges that we have, and I'm not really sure why that cut, cut off too. But, accessibility into some of these reaches and fluvial areas for some of our small surface vehicles uh, is, is a great challenge. And so one of the things we're doing is uh, deploying small uh, air-driven boats to be able to go and navigate in th through some of these areas to collect both visual data and to deploy uh, sensing technologies, whether it's just on the boat or leave it somewhere. And uh, we're able to get quite a bit of range out of these. We have 5.8 gigahertz video transmitters that give us quite some distance we can control for a long way. Uh, this is my little boat, but we actually have a little bit bigger one. And it allows us to go into, uh, right into the, uh, the thick of things. And so if you're interested in things from an in in ecological perspective, uh, turtles, what have you, wildlife, uh, this is a way to get good up, up close and personal. And I will tell you the depth in some of these areas is, is really just about an inch. So our boat goes very, very well through that. This is a 1080p HD video that's being captured. Uh, I think I just have a GoPro camera on this, but certainly we are able to send video back in real time and some of that can be captured as well. So that's some interesting things. And as, as we're down here towards the end of time, I'll just summarize with saying that uh, unmanned systems give us access to these really unique domains. Very important for civilian use. We have uh, a human team being involved, those three roles, we feel that's critical. The pilot's necessary for the understanding of those ad hoc team members as opposed to, let's say, a fully autonomous system. Finally, for civil engineers, seeing and touching is very important, so we want to be able to place things as well as take pictures of them. Typically, UAV designers and unmanned systems designers have focused on the pilots, and that leaves out the ad hoc person who may just know it when they see it. And it, it sort of would cause them a problem when they're trying to interact with the system. And finally, I think I'd like to say that human-robot interaction is really a formative field. The methods and metrics for evaluation are really still being developed. It's less than 10 years old. And really, we need these field-based studies to inform us and, and move forward. So in terms of human-robot interaction, all of you, if you're ecologists, geologists, you're effectively the killer app for this type of study. So anybody who's interested in that, please let me know. I'd be very excited to talk to you. Um, we have a list of some of the recent publications that have come out of this. Obviously, I'd like to thank our sponsors. And with that, I think we're just about out of time. Thank you. So if we have any questions for Dr. Peschel, we can take a few real quick. Or if we don't have any questions, we can come up and ask them afterwards. That's fine, too. Okay. Thank you very much.